Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. U.S. authorities say that they are ready and in position for an imminent strike against Syria. This is in response to the alleged use of chemical weapons by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. The Obama administration has not indicated whether or not it will seek congressional approval prior to launching a strike. The saber rattling is getting to a fever pitch in Washington. And now joining us to discuss all this is Vijay Prashad, who is in Beirut. Vijay is the Edward Said Chair at the American University at Beirut. He's the author of many books, including The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. And he writes regularly for the Hindu Frontline Magazine and Counterpunch. Thanks for joining us, Vijay. My pleasure. So, Vijay, let's just start off and uh, discuss the legality of an imminent strike against Syria by the United States. Is it legal for the United States, um, based on international law, to attack Syria? Well, in recent years, the United States has not always followed, you know, for a minute, let's call it international law. So, for instance, when the United States uh, launched an attack on what was then Yugoslavia and then later on Iraq, there was no uh, attempt to seek an international law framework. In fact, the United States decided that the UN Security Council was not going to vote in its direction, so it launched attacks regardless of uh, Security Council legitimacy. So that's the first thing. The U.S. doesn't always seek international law. Secondly, what international law? I mean, generally, it's, uh, you know, when a country is obliged to attack another country, it has to go to the United Nations if it's not going to be a pariah state. And in the United Nations Charter, uh, Chapter 7 authorizes the Security Council to allow member states to attack other member states. You know, it's a serious issue of when one member state decides to attack another. The Security Council has to very judiciously assess the situation and then allow member states to use so-called Chapter 7 uh, rights, which is the use of military force. Now, uh, if the UN Security Council gives the right uh, under Chapter 7, then there is some international law mandate to attack uh, another sovereign country. You know, Syria is still, despite its many problems, a standing member of the United Nations. So until there is a UN resolution under Chapter 7, which authorizes military force, any attack on Syria will be therefore illegal. And the United States in the Security Council has not been able to get a resolution. In fact, on Thursday in New York, the five prominent members held a series of meetings which have all ended, uh, you know, without agreement because the Russians who called the meeting have been unable to walk uh, the Americans and the British in particular down from the ledge of Chapter 7, uh, a Chapter 7 resolution against Syria. Okay, and Vijay, what is the strategic importance of Syria? Why, why is Syria such a player in all of this? Well, you know, Syria has been, uh, as with a number of the other countries in the Arab world, a part of this momentum that we've called the Arab Spring. Now, you know, many countries, the Arab Spring has had its back, uh, you know, its kind of turn backwards, as in Egypt, I mean, many countries, the Arab Spring has not been able to go forward, such as Bahrain. In that sense, there is no uh, special thing about Syria, except that the, there's been an enormous loss of life in Syria. 100,000 people have been killed. Uh, over 2 million people have become displaced outside the country. You know, very large number of people displaced inside the country. So the sheer enormity of the, uh, the suffering in Syria has turned the world's attention to Syria. But that's not really the issue that is driving the Western powers in, uh, you know, the Syrian theater, nor is it the issue that's driving the Russians or the Gulf Arab states or even Iran. You know, it's not the huge humanitarian suffering that's truly, uh, you know, uh, moving them. If that was indeed the case, then, for instance, let me give you a statistic. There has been a pledge of uh, almost, I think, $12 million of food aid to refugees by all these countries, you know, particularly the United States and Western Europe have, have pledged large amounts of money for food aid. But just about a little more than a percent 
of their pledges have come in to the UN agencies, which means that it's not the humanitarian issue that's actually driving their agenda. This is, a, I think, an important point to make, because they use the language of humanitarianism consistently. On the other hand, where humanitarianism, I think, is a serious issue, the crisis of millions of people, there have been empty pledges, unfulfilled pledges. So if it's not the humanitarian issue, what's moving the West in Syria? Well, you know, there is a very obvious game plan here, which is that the West has for a very long time, in fact, since 1979, sought to weaken the attempt by Iran to create a kind of independent path in uh, the Middle East. Now, whatever one thinks of Iran's own politics, whatever one thinks of the limitations of uh, the Iranian model, etc., it is certainly the case that the Iranians have you know, uh, the right nominally to uh, do their own kind of political arrangements, etc. And, uh, in fact, even if one disagrees with the Iranians, one has to disagree with, alongside the Iranians, not against them. The West has taken an antagonistic position since 1979. You know, that is the reason Saddam Hussein was sent, essentially, to fight an eight-year, very bloody war against Iran. So if you understand the Syrian context, conflict from the West perspective, they see this as an enormously productive opportunity to weaken Iran. And I think that's how they see it. And it's a very silly, very myopic approach, because what this so-called anti-Iranian policy in Syria is going to lead to is an increased sectarianism of the Middle East, you know, making the conflicts in the Middle East about Shia Sunni, it allows the West, therefore, to back the Gulf Arab states' extremely sectarian, you know, approach uh, to the, the region where they want to push an anti-Shia agenda. So, in that sense, the West, by being obsessed by an anti-Iranian politics, has begun to play alongside the Gulf Arab states in an anti-Shia politics, which impacts not only Syria, but of course Lebanon, from where I'm speaking, where the sectarian situation has already had a you know, very bloody civil war. And the last thing people in Lebanon want to see is the reopening of those wounds. So the West, you know, in its game of weakening Iran is opening a tinderbox which it just will not be able to control. You're actually in Lebanon, as you mentioned, Vijay, and uh, Hezbollah, which, who is a close ally to Iran, can you talk specifically about what their connection is to this whole uh, Syrian conflict? Uh, what, Where do they fit in into this battle? I think it's important to say, in a, a sense, that Hezbollah is not an ally of Iran or of Syria. Hezbollah is a movement that came out of, you know, sections of the Lebanese people to fight against the occupation uh, of the Israelis in 1982. So Hezbollah's principal and only, uh, you know, reason for existence is, as the Lebanese call it, the resistance. In other words, they are principally to fight for the rights of Lebanon to exist as a sovereign state and against Israel. So because this is their politics, and because they are relatively isolated along the Mediterranean coast, Hezbollah has relied greatly on Iranian uh, you know, arms support and logistical support. And it's only because they have been able to get as a pipeline through Syria to bring in that Iranian logistical support and weapons that uh, Hezbollah is so-called tied to Syria and Iran. You know, Hezbollah shares very little ideologically, uh, you, know, uh, you know, politically with the Syrian Ba'ath Party or indeed with the Vilayat-e Fakir regime in Iran. It has, its, it has very much its own view of the world. But this is for Hezbollah a pragmatic alliance. Because Hezbollah is not, you know, uh, more than simply practically linked to the Syrian regime and Iran, it, it is not... It is not programmatically linked to Syria, you know. It has no programmatic ties with Iran. It is simply a practical relationship. Because of that, rather than understand Hezbollah's role in this way, the West seeks to see Hezbollah as part of the pro-Iran axis and wishes to weaken Hezbollah. The weakening of Hezbollah is a grave threat to the fragile peace in Lebanon. And I'm afraid 
this kind of cynical, simple-minded politics that the West is trying to put forward in, in this part of the world is going to open the doors of hell. And I think that is very cavalier in its conversation about this chemical weapon attack. Of course, this chemical weapon attack, whoever did it, whether it is a chemical attack or not, whoever did it, you know, it's outrageous. And that needs to be investigated. There are U.S. steps that should be taken. But casual language about, you know, uh, we're going to uh, do this, we're going to bomb here, without understanding the very fragile peace in the neighborhood of Syria, I think that is something that, you know, uh, needs to be pointed out. The West has to recognize that when very large amounts of cruise missiles are fired into this region, the uh, effects are catastrophic for a generation at least. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, Vijay. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.